When you retire, you may get a chance to go to football heaven. This is football heaven. Hello and welcome to The Mission. I'm your host, Jameer Howerton. And as always, we have a great show for you today. Today, we're actually going to take a trip down memory lane. So please break out your pen and pads and take plenty of notes. Today, we're talking about the life and legacy of Charles Follis. But not only are we talking about the life and legacy of Charles Follis, today I'm so happy to be joined on set by actor, writer, director, and story play, Mr. Jim Stoner, who has dedicated a lot of his career to the life and legacy of Charles Follis. Mr. Stoner, welcome to the mission. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jermaine. I'm so honored to have you today. I'm so excited <laughs> because this is the first time that I'm actually in studio with a person, because normally we're doing a lot of Zoom right calls, on. And, and, and we really wanted to have this set um, today inside of the gallery, but unfortunately here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, we would have had to be in our masks and stuff. So we, we're here inside the presentation center and, 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 and from our, our hard work with the hard work of our archivist department, Mr. Mr. Jason Akins, we have some artifacts here um, that is supporting the life story of Mr. Charles Fallis today. But before we talk about Charles, Mr. Stoner, I'm so happy to talk about this man, but I'm also want to talk about your life because this is a great opportunity for us to get to know brave people, not so much brave people, but people who are stepping out and are willing to tell these really unique stories about Americans, period. Americans that have changed the face of society, Americans with a rich history that we can learn from today. Men and women that were born in 1878, 1879, yeah. played their career 1902, 1906. Right. So I really want to like not only honor them, but honor you as well today. So I can talk all day. I'm going to shut so up. So can I. But, so that's but, a problem. <laughs> right? So 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 before we before we <laughs> dive in about your great work, let's talk about what you have here today and some of the current work of what you've been doing with Charles Fallis. Okay. Well, do you want to start with what we did currently? Yes, and currently, get the signs? yes, absolutely. Well, what's really fascinating is after having worked on the Charles Fallis project, beginning with the play in 2012, after I learned about the project back in 1996, I've been able, since having written the play and staged it eight times, we've brought other people on board who've taken up the mantle to celebrate Charles Fallis. Because I started with the play in 2013 at Malabar Farm State Park after I wrote it. Started getting some attention. NFL Films heard about it. Came out, did a really nice feature on Charles Fallis and his desegregation role in Ohio. Then there was a consulting entity that also stepped up and they were participating in a documentary that was at the time being put together by Time Warner Cable. Mm -hmm. It's called Before the League. We did the premiere here wow. at the Hall of Fame. But since then, the ball just keeps rolling. And as a writer and an actor, it's been difficult for me to set the Charles Fallis project aside because it's always right here. I'm always doing a rewrite. I'm always doing a, an appearance or an interview. So it's always there and I'm always researching and finding more. And the thing that people seem to be most fascinated with, of course, is Charles' relationship to Branch Rickey, mm -hmm. which always takes and points the finger to Charles being the first black professional football player in America, and why? Well, that's because Branch, who of course signed Jackie Robinson in 1947, played football with Charles in Shelby, and they were fast friends. And Branch Rickey was the, the general manager of the Los Angeles, uh, of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Right. Excuse me. His Brooklyn Dodgers. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers. But when people hear about that, they instantly want to learn more and figure out how could this happen? How could this not have been celebrated before? So they start digging deeper. Well, then other people have been taking up the mantle, like Steve Shag and Joe Geis and Shelby, who decided to name Black Fork Commons Charles Fallis Way. And of course, Charles Fallis Way is named that because it was his demeanor, his character mm -hmm. as a leader to lead a high school football team in Worcester, Ohio as a young African-American man 
when there were no other people of color in his town. Mm -hmm. He stepped up as the leader and led him to two undefeated seasons. To people like Stephen and Joe, to then my team in Worcester, who helped me raise money for the Charles Fallis headstone yes. for the entire family. And it needed to be revamped. And the people of, of Worcester, Ohio, decided, wow, we really need to get behind this. And they did. And that, those four people on my committee all worked very diligently. We raised all the money we needed to do both the headstone and a black cyclone trail, which we're going to unveil next spring. And then that's going to chronicle Charles' journey from a young boy growing up in Worcester who just loved to play football and had all the conflict, by the way, Jameer, if you played as a young man and how your father was always saying, but I need you here at home doing stuff. Well, Dad, I got practice. I'm going off to do this. Well, Charles was at a time when the oldest boy mm -hmm. was really responsible for feeding the family. Absolutely. But here's Charles running off and playing football, playing baseball, because he loved the sport. Well, then he had an opportunity when he was offered $10 a game to move to Shelby to play for the Shelby Blues. Charles... And his father talked about it, but Charles then had a tool to send money home and still play the game he loved. Wow. But to get people excited about this story like I have in the present day, willing to carry it forward, because of these times we live in, people need to understand that we need to love and respect each other just for being people. Mm -hmm. And that sort of goes back full circle. I grew up in a really small town. Russellvania, Ohio, of all places, 450 people. And we had one person of color growing up, and it was the old African-American barber, Tabe, who lived across the street from me, oddly enough, and I would go visit him because he would knock the phone of the party line off the hook, and he was blind, largely, so I would have to go see Tabe and have a conversation with him and get his phone back on the hook. <laughs> so there was always an investment, right? Right, right. Well, besides him, there were people all over the community that we got to know as our extended family from all sorts of walks of life, mm -hmm. Germans, Italians, blacks, everybody. So then what I came to learn when I got to Ohio State is people expected kids from small towns to have prejudices. Mm -hmm. But when I learned that I had attended more weddings and funerals by the time I was 18, than most friends in college would attend in their entire life, it was like, wait a minute. We're all just people, and I'm right. not prejudiced. You expected me to be, right. but I'm not. Right. right. And that's the running theme of the Charles Fallis play, and now the screenplay, is people are just people. That's what Charles says to Branch, and Branch says to Charles. Wow. And Charles says, after Branch explains, Look, I just want to win. You win, I like you. Right. And Charles says, that's great. I'm Charles Fallis, person. And it's a key moment in the whole play. Wow. And I just love that, and that's a running theme that I want to convey today because I don't think there's a better time to ever tell that story. Wow, absolutely, Mr. Stoner. So let's just go back from the start how and why and what attracted to you to Charles's story? Why Charles? I have always been passionate about football. Mm -hmm. Loved playing football. Whether it was four or five of us in the backyard slugging it out in the snow and the mud and the ice. And we killed my neighbor's new trees that he kept trying to plant in the front yard at least eight times, he says. <laughs> but then... Um, I have some of those kids that are killing my grass right now. That they say, get out of my front yard. Go play in the backyard. <laughs> right on. And I, I just loved, loved the game and started to study the history of it and how it all began here in Ohio. Uh -huh. At a young age, I was brought here to wow. the Hall of Fame and got a printout somewhere of all the teams from Cleveland and how it was the Cleveland Rams. And then it became the St. Louis Rams. And then the Browns came back to Cleveland. And all this evolution, it was fascinating to me. Well, then I got involved in theater and the arts and had a huge hiatus where I couldn't pursue either for a long time. But then 
when I could, I was able to combine my theater and my passion for Charles when I ran across this picture. Okay. I was walking through Shelby's Museum of History when I was the Chamber of Commerce president there. And of course, with my knowledge of football at the time, I see this photo. Okay. And I said, hold, hold it. First of all, why is there a black gentleman in this photo? And on top of that, there's a white guy standing next to him with his hand on his shoulder. What a bold move is that in 1902? It's a lot. That's a, that's, that, that's a lot. That, that, that's loaded. That's, that, is, <laughs> that is really, that's validation. Absolutely. That's, that's a calming, um, hey, he's, he's one of us. He's fine. He's right. okay. When you think about that date, 1902. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, think about it. And a lot of folks would overlook that. Right. But you can't. You can't. And Frank was smart enough. And, and, who, and, and, what was the, what, and what was the manager's name? Frank Schiffer. Frank Schiffer. S-C-H-I-F-F-E-R. Okay. He was a tobacco merchant in Shelby. Okay. Well-respected. His wife, Julia, was also well-respected. Started the PTA and the Friends of the Library and was one of those women who just ruled the roost. And we... We convey that in the play and the film okay. as Julia is this big, powerful, strong leader in the family. But Frank is all about football and raising money for this new thing called football. And we talk about the Carlisle Indians because okay. football was a fledgling tool to Americanize Indians, too, at wow. the Carlisle Indian School. So Frank's reading all the time and looking at what football can do. And then they have the first game under the lights in Chicago between Wisconsin and Carlisle Indians. And think of that, Julia, we can do that in Shelby. And that's when he meets Charles. Okay, that's what I'm saying, how did he meet Charles? Um, Shelby, as an indicated in this book, okay. <laughs> which is written by Fred Eichinger in Shelby, Ohio. This okay. is the history of Shelby football. Wow. And it's been very helpful. And it talks about what an incredible team Shelby had. Okay. Back in the day, from the late 1800s, clear through almost 1912, 1913, before it became really corrupt, um, Shelby would just march through the league. Wow. They would score 136 points in a season. Their opponents would score 22. I mean, a bunch of steel-making boys, as they were described, because okay. they had the steel mill in Shelby. Okay. And they would just whoop everybody's butt. Okay. Well, um, Frank loaded up the Shelby team and went to Worcester to play against the Worcester Athletic Club <laughs> and met Charles in his first year with the Worcester Athletic Club. Okay. And the headline in the Worcester newspaper read, in 1902, Worcester only loses to Shelby eight to nothing. Due to, due to the outstanding play of Charles Follis, the Black Cyclone, on both offense and defense. Wow. And reportedly, then, Frank walks up to Charles, introduces himself, and says, I never want to play against you again, young man. <laughs> I'd like to pay you $10 a game to come and play in my town. Well, of course, we didn't have phones and the Internet and all this research available to us. Charles didn't know Shelby from right. Orville or Worcester or Smithville. Right. Come to find out, Shelby was one of many communities in Ohio that is listed as a sundown town. Okay. And the sundown town means that if you're of African descent, you need to be in the house during sundown. You need to be out of town. Okay. Okay. It said. Okay. All right. I, I want to put this in Remember, proper context for absolutely because right now this is a, this is really a golden opportunity to really tell history and and we're so glad to have you here. Well, you have to remember. No, no, yeah, you hear? yeah. The, that America had a period in its life right during Restoration. Absolutely. When blocking was occurring with uh -huh. real estate. Oh yeah, red people lining, of color yes. were blocked Absol out of communities like absolutely. Shelby. Absolutely. And many communities actually had signs up wow. in their town that said, excuse the expression, boy, don't let the sun set on your shoulders. Mm. 
Well, Frank was taking Charles to, a, to one of those towns. Okay. Wow. <laughs> to be a football star. Wow. Well, he was smart enough to also recruit a young man from Ohio Wesleyan who had brought, who had encouraged white men and blacks to play together on the baseball teams and the football teams. Mm-hmm. Well, Frank thought, I can help him smooth over the, he can help me smooth over the ruffled feathers in Shelby. And he did. Wow. And they became good friends. And this young man, Branch, would usher Charles around town, get him in town and home before dark, and they roomed together. They had lived in the same house. So Branch looked after Charles. So, so Branch was pretty, wow, okay, okay, huh, I yeah. can't even talk. Okay. He was that yeah. involved in Charles' life in wow. Shelby. And they became so fast this, so, friends. So, so, okay, it makes perfect sense now. And Branch was why, a running back too, just And why Branch one. felt so comfortable yet confident to know that this could work because he had firsthand experience. Right on. I've spoken with Branch Ricky the third. Okay. <laughs> wow. And he. Because that's what I want to get into. Like before we talk about his name, his nickname, and how he got okay. that. I really wanted to really dive in because I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to moderate this. I'm, I'm I'm a point guard right now, so I'm giving it to you to shoot, but then we got to give it to Charles to shoot. So right now, All right. So right now, before we give it back to you to shoot, because I really want to talk about your 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 research and how you went about getting your research and who you spoke to and just okay. documenting all that because it's a lot but the title black cyclone his 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 nickname i i because because you know you hear that and you question it you know it's kind of like the black cyclone hmm Okay, what did that mean? 1902, 1906, was it a positive thing? Was it a good thing? But it stuck, but you know, was it kind of like, you know, because we're talking about a period of time, like you said, boy, you better get out of town before the yeah. sun hits your shoulders. Yeah. So I, I, that's why I question, I, that's the only reason why I question his, 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 uh, his nickname, the Black Cyclone. That's was it what, what, Was it kind of like a, a clowning joke? Like, okay, here goes the Black Cyclone. He's about to run through us, offense and defense. Or was it like, yo, dog, he's like a cyclone because a cyclone will come and just clean stuff up. Right. So I, that's why I, I question that. I ask your, that's you know, a, That's an excellent question. I'm going to warn you using a basketball analogy because I'm likely to foul you. <laughs> If, since you're using the basketball analogy, but the Charles Fallis nickname, the Black Cyclone, I, from all the reading I've been able to do in all the Worcester newspapers, this book, yeah. the Shelby papers, Charles was revered. Wow. He was the only black player in the league. Okay. And he was a beast. Wow. He played defensive end. He was a fullback. Okay. And he would just run the ball all day on offense and tear him up on defense. Right. And local communities that were going to play against Charles went so far as to when Charles arrived in Toledo, for example, the audience was known to, and this is um, chronicled in this book, Charles was playing against Toledo and the, the crowd was screaming racial epithets at Charles. Right, right. Which, to be, to be, you know, to be quite honest with you, we're not surprised. I mean, no. it is what it is. You ever been to a baseball game of <laughs> little leaguers? You can hear the parents doing it today. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> but football then? Right. The communities were getting really passionate about it. Right. Two and three thousand people were already starting to show up at football games. Wow. There weren't even bleachers. Right. <laughs> they were just lining the ropes. Along. I can only I can only imagine being the first of the first to have to oh, deal with all that. But they're Jackie screaming. Yeah. They're screaming at right. Charles. Rip his head off. Kill him. Mm. You know, take him out. Right. You know, they use the N word. They just went crazy with right. it. Right. Right. Finally, about halfway through the second quarter, the captain of the Toledo game stops it. He waves his hands, gets the referee's attention, and he addresses the crowd. Wow. He said, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Fallis is not a nigger. Charles Fallis is a fine sportsman and an athlete and a winner. If we can't beat these Shelby boys with Charles, we don't want to beat them. So either you will cease calling him names or we will end this game right now. 
Wow. Talk about a brave young man. Right. So the crowd straightened up. Yeah. And they proceeded with the game. And that's a game I like to chronicle with a fun story that really happened in the Fallis family. Right. Um, when Charles would break for a long run, reportedly his little sister, Lucy, when she was 10, would jump up and run the length of the field while Charles was running, screaming, run, Charles, run! <laughs> and we use that in the play and the film. Right, right. The Black Cyclone. Right. And we have it then ending with Charles, as he did reportedly. Yeah. He would stop and kneel and give Lucy the ball. Oh, man. And just, that's magic. How... <laughs> Wow, like you're you're actors because like you mentioned before, like this is a playwright as well. Um, how is it for your actors to recreate that and have to really dive in and put themselves oh. in that in that time period where certain things were allowed and certain things were said and done? How is it for them to experience that? That's a great question, Jameer, and I love it because that brings me to the point when I was writing it, I was really nervous about using the right, 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 as right. I just did. I got chills on the back of my neck. Right. But we had well, no, to... No, that's real, though. We had and, to convey and, and sometimes it. we have to go there it and bring real. the real life. Thank you. Bring it real life. So, no, there's no offense. We're, we're talking about history and what happened and, quite frankly, what still happens today. You're right. So let's just... We, we keep Look, it... We keep it at a buck. We're, we're, we're keeping, keeping it, it real. Buck 50. Well, we, 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 we wiped... I would sit down. I had to recruit a woman to play Kate, mm -hmm. Charles's mother. Right. And his four sisters. Wow. I needed a pastor. So I actually recruited some pastors and had them read for me. Right. So we had all these people from all walks of life in the play. And we had two people in the show that are just out and out horrible racists. Mm. And use the N-word all the time. And talk so about you actually gonna... had people that were like on a scale of one to ten. They were past five. They were oh. qualified. Oh yeah, they were plotting to kill Charles' brother Curtis. Wow. While he was playing football. Wow. Which actually happened. He died playing football. Curtis. Really. When he was sixteen. And we have this one character in the play that I dubbed Larry, who just hated. Hated, All hated, people of color. Hey, he was and hate, hate, and hated he's the hate fact, personified. Wow, and he hated the fact that this was going on at this period of time. Oh, yeah. Wow. And I staged the football games with the crowd screaming, wow. kill the nigger, rip yeah. his head off, in front of these little girls. But they have grown up, and they have done the show six times. Mm -hmm. They're growing up before my eyes. But their mother understands the importance of them seeing what America used to be like. And the importance of somebody like Charles being able to step out and win over a community right. like Shelby. Right. When Shelby finally celebrates Charles at the end of his career and yeah. due to injuries, leaves the game and on Thanksgiving, they carry him off the field on their shoulders, the crowd, at the end of the game. So Charles completely turned them around. I use a scene in the play and in the film at Weber's Bar. At Weber's Bar, which still exists in Shelby, which wow. is neat, the team would always retreat there after the games and have beers. Mm -hmm. Well, now Charles is on the team. And the bar owner is like, Frank, I can serve everybody but him. Right. You know. And Frank's like, you know, we can go down the street. Mm. <laughs> wow. There's another pub in town. Wow. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe we can find a spot for him. Wow. So, you know, initially they had to ease into that kind of a scenario. Yeah. But, you know, those, that was life in Ohio 120 years ago. Right. 120 years ago. And we're still fighting some of those battles And some today. of it's going on right now. And which it, is crazy. Right. 
Right. And I hope I'm answering your question. No, no, no. You the do research a great job. I'm doing. The no. research has been all over the place. Um, right. But what are you learning from? So my question: not only what are you learning from the research, but what is it like hearing the re like the stories? I, I know that right there is not saying <laughs> your Bible, but it, but it does cover a lot. It but does. like but like you just you said earlier, you spoke to Branch Ricky the Third. Oh. What was that conversation like of of getting the, you know just first account experiences of what his great great grandfather went through. This is really going to catch you off guard, but when I talked with Branch Ricky the Third the first time, nice person. I call him on the phone, had sent him an email. He's like, hi, Jim. He's, a, he's in um, Colorado. Okay. He works in baseball still. They own it. He's on the board of directors for a minor league baseball team. Right. But he said, Jim, first of all, I want to let you know how naive I am. Where in the hell is Shelby, Ohio? So I had to tell him where Shelby was. <laughs> and then he said, and I got to tell you, I didn't know my grandpa played football. I said, really? Wow. He said, yeah. He said, but I'm going to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. And he said, my grandpa branch never told the same story twice, except one. And he said, when he was traveling, playing minor league baseball in the late teens, early 20s, he was a catcher. And you have to understand my grandfather's fingers were just gnarled with arthritis and from being busted so many times being a catcher because the equipment just wasn't any good right but he stood there and he'd look in your eyes and there'd be a circle of people standing around him and he'd say you know one time the team was traveling just outside chicago and we had a young ma black man on our team then and he said we checked into a hotel and the hotel clerk as we checked in, said, that black person can't stay here. No coloreds allowed. And Branch went over to him and said, I, I went over to him and I said, go up to my room, Charlie. We'll get you a cot. Don't you worry. You wait for me up there. Here's the key. We'll be up in a little while. Well, then Branch and, his, and the team manager finally get up to the room and here's this African-American man sitting on the edge of the cot bawling mm -hmm. tears streaming down his face and he's pulling on his fingers as hard as he can pull just pulling on him and Branch sits down next to him and says what are you doing? What, what's going on? We thought we overcame all this and he says I'm as good as any man on this team if I could just wipe this color off of me, then by God, I'd be just like him. It, to think that we make people feel that way, that I'm not adequate, unless I change something as fundamental yeah. as how I look. Yeah. And that story has stuck with me ever since Branch the Third told it to me. And we incorporated it into the screenplay. Wow. And... That's, that's powerful. How has this story made you a better person? And how has it helped you with race relationships and just going into the schools and spending time to, to educate kids today? It's really opened my mind to view the steps you can make to really get out of your skin and into somebody else's, no pun intended. Right. And view it from where they grew up versus where you grew up. What are their challenges and their differences versus you, having walked from Russellvania, Ohio, to the Ohio State University? I've traveled all over the country, but now telling this story over and over again, and then in light of what's going on now, mm -hmm. people are teaching me how to change my perspective and my language but yet sharing with me how important it is to tell the story the way it really was. We can't forget history if we ever expect things to change. Absolutely. You gotta know where you came from. You gotta know, know where, where you, you came from. You're right on. Absolutely. If you don't know, if you don't stand for something, you fall yeah. for anything. <laughs> right on. You know? And um, I'm and it, just mostly the perspective of getting to know people where they're at. Mm-hmm. And the first time I staged the play, 
I sat with a young young African American man who lived in Shell lived in Mount Vernon. Right. And I I interviewed him and would sit with him for weeks leading up to the first staging of the play. And I would ask him to create Charles character. I said, think about your character your personal experiences, Mike, and tell me what you think you bring to the table to be Charles. How would Charles work through this challenge? And that gave me some unique insights as to what he has to face as a young African-American man in central Ohio where there are a few people of his color. Right. And I've subsequently done that with every actor that's of color in the show. Right, right. And one gentleman in particular, his name's Steve Jefferson, okay. has portrayed Charles' father for me five times. Wow. And he grew up in East Cleveland. So, you know, he didn't yeah. know many white people. Right, right. And now he's in this play and he has to see firsthand and relive the kinds of things that went on. And Steve said to me after he read this, the play and the screenplay, which we walked through in last November, he said, Jim, the language isn't strong enough. Mm. I'm like, what? <laughs> I thought you might be taken aback by it. He's no. My mom and dad tell me, he said, by the way, you left a part out. He said, when my mama took us shopping for shoes in Cleveland, mm -hmm. we couldn't try the shoes on. So we would go into the shoe store, and my mother would open up her purse and pull out pieces of paper that we had traced our footprint on. And that's how we had to buy shoes, because we weren't allowed to try on white people's shoes. I said, wow. And to hear these stories just makes your skin crawl. And that's what people do need to see. Yeah. But then see Branch and Charles yucking it up at their apartment and being just people, right? Before there was Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo, oh. there was Branch, Ricky, and Charles Follis. And that's ex you said it the same way as Archie Griffin did when I was telling him about it over the telephone. Right. I was explaining it to Archie because I really wanted Archie to come see my play, uh -huh. which he did. Right. And he ended up sponsoring it for us in Columbus, Ohio. That's amazing. But he said, I called him about it and was laying it out for him. And he says, so Jim, what you're telling me is if you hadn't had Charles Fallis, you wouldn't have had Branch Rick, you wouldn't have had Jackie Robinson for decades. Right on. And all these people from Gale Sayers to Yeah. Bill I just get Wills. goosebumps because it's like now I know what well, I don't know, excuse me, I take that back. I have an idea of the character, the integrity, the respect, the discipline, the, the characteristics of where and the model, if I can say, of who Jackie Robinson was in the image of. Because if Branch Ricky stepped out and tried to find that next Charles follows. Right. Here we have insert Jackie Robinson because Jackie Robinson because we 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 know that we know the stats and we know the story of like well they're better players but it's not about the player and it's not about yes Jackie Robinson was a baller but but he fit that character that demeanor right that person that can handle the broad shoulders if you will Atlas if you will to to, to be in that time period. And then for Branch Rickey, not only to see it firsthand because he was with Charles, but now he's in a different role where he has to mentor and see it again with Jackie Robinson. Right. And then to think that Charles Fallis died in 1930, you know, people say, well, why didn't we, any of us know this story? Well, Charles was gone. He had no children. And so his story nearly disappeared. But wow. because of Branch, yeah. it lived a, on. There was a connection there. There was a connection. And, and, and it and, got and, brought back to life. Right. And people stumbled on it in the 70s. Yeah. And they first wrote an article about it. And then it carried forth. And then I wrote the play in 2013. And we've been celebrating it in a big way ever since. Isn't it amazing how sports, and we always talk about here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and um, we like to show not only do we talk about our mission and our values before every meeting, but we tend to show um, this, this piece that we have, and it's called the huddle. 
And essentially, I'm paraphrasing a lot of it, but it's a great piece. And it really talks about inside that huddle, how there are so many different walks of life and how it doesn't matter your race, your color, your creed, and how we all come together for one common cause during that time in the huddle. And also talks about how race relationships within that huddle, you know, little country boys from, you know, would, would, would offer, you know, young black kids from the urban uh, uh, concrete, if you will, to come sit down at the table of unity and have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And you've seen race relations reform. You've seen races changed. And it's just amazing how sport, the game of football, the game of baseball, just that the bravery of men stepping out on faith to say, the content, the character within this man's heart. Just like you said, you had you had Charles trying to just you can't you can't. He's at a, it sounded like he was at a breaking point. Yeah, he's at a breaking point of like, man, I just wish I can just get this because it doesn't matter. I know I'm top five on the team. I know I'm an MVP. I know what I bring. But not only that, I am a good person. I am a I'm a great American. Right. And it's just a mate. You know, it's just it's it's um. It's baffling, but then I have to ask you this question. Do we still have a long way to go, man? I'm blessed to have a cousin to my father who is 108. Wow. <laughs> and she pause, is, pause, pause for that. You got, we got to go back. Did you, 108. <laughs> 108. Can you believe it? Wow. And her name is Susie Fanny Brown. Okay. okay. Wow. And she is as smart and as on point as you are on anything you want to talk to her about. Mm. And she just had a knee replacement surgery, which is incredible. But anyway. 108. At 108. But she and I were discussing just this, race relations in America. And she said, Jim, she said, I look back at all the things I've lived through. And I look at the 60s. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the 60s, early 70s, we we're really starting to make strides. But how can we really conceive of solving 400 years of oppression with a few acts of Congress and a few bills and really only 50 years of civil rights? How can we solve that? There is no way we can, can, we can really conceive of that, I don't think. You can't just take a pill and say, okay, we're not going to be prejudiced anymore. We're not right. going to look at each other differently anymore. Right. You've got to have, I think, because I'm a storyteller, right. you've got to show people stories that how other people do relate to people and overcome those things. Absolutely. And we really feel as though the Black Cyclone, the, stor the story and now the film are a great way to tell that and help everybody overcome it. And I am so looking forward to working with a great team of actors that we've talked with and the great director that we're signing on and the great people that are backing this film because mm -hmm. we've got a solid team of producers so that they can really even conjure up better ways mm -hmm. of crafting this story to reach the millions. Because this story has reached thousands the last few years. Right. And with your help today, yeah. Yeah, the Charles Fallis is going to become a household name one way or the other in my lifetime. You know, I don't know why <laughs> the cosmos chose me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Jim, Jim, hey, Jim, right. look over there because you're going to tell that story the next 30 years of your life. <laughs> well, well, no, the, the creator's definitely <laughs> using you for a vessel. It's a because, truth. Because when I got the, the, the email and the call from our executive producer, George Veris, it's Saturday, and you're just kind of relaxing, wow. and I just started going through, and it just, it, it, it <laughs> perked me up. Yeah. And I just start, I, and I go right to my computer, I'm writing notes, and I have questions, I have questions, because I'm just fascinated, I'm locked in, and then I came to work the next day, and he was like, hey, what about a mission podcast? I was like, that's our next guest. He was like, well, go for it. I'm going to put together an email. And then you and I just started connecting That's right awesome, away. That's awesome, Jameer. Thank you. Know, you. Because so my cool. whole thing is, in these trying times, you know, thank God for Black History Month, because it is a time where black Americans get a chance to celebrate. But my thing is, that's cool, but it's American history. 
It's American history. And American history doesn't need to be taught in February. It needs to be taught 365 days a year. And when I see a story like this, and when I see the bravery of men, and, when, and I love sport and how sport is that great unifier, let's tell oh. this story right now. And I'm so happy to have you on here today. And I know we spoke off camera before, but um, you talked about different examples of how we want you want to build and put together your artists and your actors of actually yeah. going to, to the school and having those assemblies yeah. and having that conversation because I really think that's where it starts. You can have a big assembly but little small groups where you can just get people yeah. to kind of just get the conversation going because yes we yes a lot has happened and yes we we we, we, we we've accomplished a lot but we still have so far to go because you look at soccer, you look at European football, some of the African-American athletes are being ridiculed and yelled at and bananas and they're being you know, told racial slurs or whatever. We look at what happened you know, during the Pittsburgh Steelers and the, and, and, and the Cleveland Browns game last year. We don't know what allegedly been said or whatever the case may right. be. But we do know, I have experience of working inside a locker room. And I am a, a firm believer of, hey man, think about that word and how you using it in this rap music and think about how you're saying it so freely and uniquely because you have your white brethren who's right next to you and he may be feeling uncomfortable. So you don't want him saying it. So don't right. you say it. And I don't want to hear this term of endearment, and I know I'm going to catch a lot of heck, but hey, it is what it is. No. Right. No. Like, right. cut it out. He can't say it. You can't say it. <laughs> no one can say it. Right on. So I, I, I am so honored and the impact that you're having on this story. When is some do so, so you had to play running. When, when, when we be able to catch another play or, or do you have another play in the works, uh, another show day, or do you have like, when is the um, actual uh, broadcast coming out? I mean, or, or the, the, yeah. the, the actual movie. I'm working right now with a couple of different cities who are interested in staging the Black Cyclone play. Okay. Again. Gotcha. Um, and we're gonna, I'm, actually putting that on the back burner until we get through COVID. Yes. Because it's really impossible at this stage of the game, no pun intended. Love those puns. <laughs> stage. Um, but we can't even stage a play and make it cash flow. Right. So we're going to wait. And fortunately, when we were in LA this spring, we were able to focus on the film. Right. Which is really cool because people were just sitting around not doing a lot and we were able to harness Right. Some fantastic people, their energies, and it's moving forward, and we're projecting to film next spring and summer into fall. Okay. When the weather really starts to change. Yes. And we're looking at a release next Christmas, maybe first part of 2022. I can't wait to bring my daughter. I can't wait for her to see this. I think play. a lot of people are saying that. Yeah. And when we share this information, we're really psyched about the team of producers we have put together, and it's moving forward. Right. And, but that doesn't stop me in my conversations. If somebody picks up the phone right. or emails me and says, Jim, I'd like to bring some actors into the classroom. Right. Then I'll say, would you like to use your students or do you want me to bring actors in? I, because you know, I love it when last year and the year before, we staged the play at Mansfield Senior High. Mm. And though I did reach back on my pool of actors and bring some main characters in. Yeah. I incorporated them into the show. I've even gone as far as to use a school that helps young challenged youth that are right on the last step before getting into the system. Yeah. They grab them and try to straighten them out and help them. Well, th this, is, this is an impactful story. I need football players every time I do the play. Right, right. So I reach out to them right. and say, hey, I need 10 guys. Can you bring them over? Right. And I work with them for weeks. And then they see the story. Mm -hmm. And they start to learn and behave differently, I hope. When you have your character, your main character, and you spoke about this a little bit a little earlier, yeah. but your main character who plays Charles Follis, I know you placed a lot on him. But after you guys have your last show and you strike the set, 
Do you get a chance to follow back up with him to find out what he took away from the whole story oh, yeah. and how that changed his life? Because I am like amazed to want to know who played Charles and what they took away from that story oh. and how that story has helped them in their walk. I don't want to speak too specifically for, for, for poor Mike, who was my first Charles. Okay. But he has really changed his life and took a different direction hmm. and is on a different walk. But another Charles that I incorporated, I've had four Charles Follises. Got you. There's one in Mansfield, and Damien was just featured on a news presentation when we did the dedication of Charles Follis Way in Shelby. He came in character. Okay. And spoke to what it has meant to him. And Damien has made some poor decisions in his life. Mm -hmm. He was incarcerated for a while. Right. He's gotten out. Got you. But he's got a business now. His life's come together, but he can only imagine the hardship, to put it in his words, that Charles has fa had faced and what he had to do in a white man's world to overcome it. Mm. But he's there. Right. And he feels honored to have looked within himself to bring out that emotion, which now I'm getting into theater speak, which a lot of people don't hear about. But Damien is a great classic example of how you can really impact an actor by letting them play a role. Wow. Damien has also played Henry. Okay. So, because the show's been going on so long, yeah. he got a little bit older. A little older. I brought in a little younger Charles. Right. And it's really been incredible to watch these people. Wow, Mr. Stoner, I can't... You know, so but, we, 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 but we look back at this picture and you yeah. look at the confidence and you look at his demeanor and you look at his other teammates and I don't see any division. I don't see any beef amongst them. Look here. Like he's realistic. He's, this guy's leaning on He's Charles. leaning on him. He has his arm on his thigh. And like I said, it's loaded that the manager, but it's almost like it's, there's, a, there's a, a cool confidence about this man. Jim, I know we've covered a lot with the life and legacy of Charles Fallis. And I know there's a lot of legislation that goes into, you just don't get a, 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 you know, a, a street sign or a street named after you, but talk about some of the other things that the state of, of Ohio has gotten involved into celebrating the excellence and the life and legacy of Charles Fallis. Well, when we staged the Black Cyclone, the play at Malabar Farm, I invited some public officials to come and speak and be a part of it. And they had never heard of Charles Fallis or the Black Cyclone. And one of them was Mark Romanchuk, who at the time was the representative from our district. And he saw this and went, what? And he contacted Representative Wiggum from Worcester and they co-drafted legislation naming February 3rd Charles Fallis Day in the state of Ohio. Which is phenomenal to recognize an African-American in Ohio for anything, but what a pioneer. And yeah. Charles is such a great example of what young men should investigate. So they're making Charles Follis Day February 3rd. We drafted legislation the first time in 2015. It got all the way through the House. It got to the Senate. It got bogged down. And it didn't get passed. Mm. So then the next year, Mark calls me and says, Jim, let's do this again. It yeah. was just that we were struggling with the budget a lot last year. Let's go. So we did it again. So we had to redraft the legislation, go testify again and again and again. I took actors with me. It really turned into kind of a fun event. Right. But we did get it passed. Wow. And we had family members in the room. We've had a lot of great experiences come from Charles Fallis Day. We, of course, celebrated it in a nice big way in Shelby right. last year. Right. Which when you think about what I told you about Shelby, wow. Yeah, yeah. And Richland County and hopefully all over the country will continue to celebrate Charles Follis Day. And a follow up with that, his his descendants, his, his family members, his great great grandchildren, nieces, nephews, what, what, what do they say about the great work and that you and your team have been doing? We're get, we have a great relationship. I can pick up the phone and call any number of them. We just purchased the headstone that we had made right. to celebrate Charles. And the local cemetery director at Worcester 
you have to do it when it's done. You have to set it when mm -hmm. the guy delivers it. It's just, <laughs> so he already put it in place. Right. We haven't dedicated that yet. I called the daughters of Charles' younger brother last week and said, would you like to have a dedication this fall? Maybe on the day of Charles' last football game, which I found, or wait till spring. Uh -huh. And they're like, well, Jim, we'll let you know. It's Sandra Smith and Muriel Edwards. Wow. And Herman Smith. Okay. Are the key family members that I work with. I've got a quick funny story about how they learned Absolutely. about my play. When we staged it at Malabar Farm the first time, I had struggled and couldn't find any family members. Okay. And finally, at, in the second weekend of the play, the woman that's selling tickets comes up to me and says, Jim, I got a strange phone call the other day. <laughs> and it was from somebody that said they were related to Charles. I'm like, what? She said, yeah, they're all going to be here Saturday night. So that night at about... How nervous were you? Oh, my gosh. I'm scared to death. I'm scared now. Because um, <laughs> you, like, did all your work and research, but up until that point... I made it all... I, I made most of it up. Wow. Except for what I researched and right. actually read on right. the newspaper. Right. But I had to create the yeah. relationships of the family. Right. And, because the family is prominent okay. in this whole thing. Well, Curtis' death, for heaven's sake, mm -hmm. on the field... I had to recreate all this. Well, they roll in with about 15 family members. Herman Smith, the real speaker of the family, uh -huh. says, well, Jim, I was sitting in the living room with my kids, and I was explaining to them and their friends again that their great uncle, Charles Fallis, is the first black professional football player in America. And they're like, get out of here, Dad. That's not true. You've been telling that story forever. He says, no, really. Right, right. I'm going to look it up online right now. <laughs> so he goes to the computer and he starts Googling it. And up pops my play. And he's like, holy crap. And that's how he brought his two aunts, his mother, his aunt, and his kids. Wow. And some of their friends to the play. So how many and that's when we met. So how many brothers and sisters did he have? Charles had... His youngest brother, Joseph. Okay. Four sisters. Mm. And Curtis. And Curtis is one that passed on the football field. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and all of them had had their, their family. Yeah. Got you. And unfortunately, he didn't have any kids, did he? No. Died at a very young age. 30. 30. Man. As a baseball player. Man. And that's another thing we didn't talk about. He actually <laughs> went on to play in the Negro League. He was like Bo Jackson. Wow. He was an incredible baseball player slugger and a catcher he played for the college of worcester okay and he may have been one of the first pers he may have been one of the first people to integrate college baseball as a young black man playing for the college of worcester so, so there are photos of that. all the way around he was a pioneer he was not afraid to go anywhere no, like I said, we look at that picture and we finish our final oh. thought on that picture. He did not look shook at all. He looked extremely relaxed and comfortable. You know, this guy over here looks a little more nervous than Charles. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And Frank, I think, had a lot to yeah, do with that. Yeah, that's clear. Saying that I'm, I'm here for you. Yeah, that's clear. That's clear. We do this in the play, by the way. Oh, the reenactment of the picture. Yeah. Wow. And we actually incorporate into it a photographer coming up to Frank and Charles at the end of the game uh -huh. after they won the championship. And the photographer says, hey, Mr. Schiffer, do you mind if we get a team photo? Not at all. So then they stage the picture. Okay. The photographer says, hey, Frank, are you sure you want me to take the picture with your hand, you know, shut up and take the damn picture. This is all in the play. Wow. And then we project the picture on the screen above it. And then have the guys posing beneath it. That's amazing. It's a neat snapshot. That's amazing. I want to thank you for changing my life and impacting my life and bringing this story to me because I would be a fool to say that it didn't give me some type of inspiration. So thank you. And guys, thank you so much for joining us right here on The Mission. For Mr. Jim Stoner, I'm Jameer Howerton. We'll see you next time.